you guys have been tracking with us, we are in the final week of our adulting series where we are not teaching you how to get out of mom and dad's basement, but we are showing you what the Bible says about becoming a mature follower of Christ. And to do that, we've just been going chapter by chapter through the book of James. And what I love about James is that James is writing to the church to people who have already made the decision to follow Christ. That's the first thing you wanna understand as we read through James. James is not giving you the recipe to say, if you do A, B, C, then you can be saved. How many understands that salvation is the free gift of grace from God through Christ Jesus, his son? You guys believe that with us? We're all on the same page? Good, you're welcome to stay here then. If not, we'll get your your theology straightened out later. So James isn't saying to these people, this is what you need to do in order to be saved. He's actually saying the exact opposite. He's saying, because you're saved, these are the things that need to be evident. But what I wanna show you this morning, I told you guys that this is the first letter that was written to the New Testament church. So Acts 2 happens, Holy Spirit falls down. There's a fresh communication language that happens between God and man. The language goes forth and 3,000 people make a decision to follow Christ right there in that moment. And then the Bible says that there are numbers added to the church every single day. Day And at that point, they're just gathering around in big auditoriums and communities together and they're giving to one another and they're being the hands and feet of Christ. And then Stephen, one of the disciples of Jesus, is martyred. And the church says, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, they're killing folks now. It's one thing when they were just trying to cancel us. It's one thing when they were just, you know, shunning us or not allowing us to play games together anymore. But now they're actually killing people. And so what happens is the church scatters. And what I love about James here is that you never find a single point in the book of James where he's chastising the people of God for fleeing in the face of some kind of treacherous event. He doesn't, he doesn't come at them, but what he does is he encourages them and he says, even when the world is going to oppress you, even when the world is gonna to try to cancel you, even when the world is going to shun you, you still must carry on this gospel as evidence in your life. And so what he's doing to the church now, he's saying, I know that you're scared. I know that you're uncertain. I know that we've gone all over the place now. It started out really cool. Big church, all of a sudden pop up overnight. Everything seems to be going well and then people start dying and now all of a sudden, It's like, do I really want to live this out loud or do I just want to be, what do we call it at Thanksgiving, Doc? A sino? Christian in name only. (laughs) I don't actually want to live this life out. I just, but it feels good to call, to be called a Christian. I mean, the more that you guys get to know this community, this is a fun group of people. Teresa and Aaron had, what was it, 36 people uh, for Thanksgiving. That's a lot of turkey. And knowing those jokers, they still had leftovers. Like, (laughs) that was like a Jesus with the fishes and loaves kind of mode right over there, man. They just kept breaking that turkey and the legs just kept showing up. But James is talking to a people now who identify as followers of Christ, but he says, I don't want you just to be Christians by name. We need to actually live this out You understand at the heart of this community right here is we say we want to live a life that invites others to embrace Jesus, that we come to church on Sunday morning so that we can be filled up not just for ourselves, but so that we can go serve the community around us. Sometimes it needs to start with your home. Other times it's going to go into your workplace and into your schools. But regardless of where you are, you are on mission. And so we live on purpose. And so James is giving us the expectations for what we should see in the life of a believer. If you've been tracking with us over the first four chapters, I kind of just took uh, a single piece out of different chapters of the books. And I would say this is something great we can focus on with the understanding that should the Lord tarry, we can jump into the other pieces later on down the road. But as I was reading through James 5, I just couldn't find a breaking point. I know that, you know, the editors came in there and they kind of chopped the book up into three nice little pieces there. But everything I read, it was like, well, if I'm going to do part one, then I absolutely have to have part two. It's not that they're just both good ideas in and of themselves, they are, but they're so intricately woven together, I don't see how I'm gonna be able to separate the two of these. And then the foundation that he brings at the end of the chapter is so necessary. I said, all right, we're just gonna try to steadily, but hastily move all the way through the entire book of, or I'm sorry, the entire chapter of James 5. So would you guys stand with me one more time as we honor God in the reading of his word. Again, this isn't religious habit. This isn't your chance to go to the bathroom one more time and get coffee. You missed that opportunity. 
But this is the recognition that what we read, what we're reading right now, this is absolute truth. What we're reading right now is the tool that you go to when you say, I'm having a hard time hearing God. I like to say that the Bible is the closed caption. When the world gets loud and you say, I don't know, I can't, I'm having a problem hearing him. Man, open up that book. We recognize this is your absolute truth, Lord, and your word. So I'm gonna just start with verse one. And what I'm gonna warn you with right now, because I know how church folks are, as soon as we start talking about what he brings up in verse one, a bunch of you are gonna be like, ah, la, 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 la. I don't want it. But he's not talking about what you think he's talking about. And you will miss the point if you focus on what you see right on the surface. And I'm gonna show it to you right here. Here we go. Verse one, he says, now listen, you rich people. Oops. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming unto you. James is just throwing out love here, y'all. At the end of the book, even. Your wealth has rotted. Your moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and your silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. <laughs> now you gotta ask, when you read something like that, what, man, like, who spit in that man's cereal that morning? Like, what was it that really incited this conversation right here? And I think we find it there at the end of verse three. He says, you've hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who moved the fields are crying, mowed the fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. Right after Thanksgiving, man, they're just talking about being fat. Come on, let's pray. Holy Spirit, if they just hear me, they're not gonna get a single thing. Oh, but God, if you speak, if we hear not just the words of a man, but we hear the voice of the one that calls us by name, the voice that does more than just speak, but there's actually creation that's happening as you speak, create in us a clean heart. Lord God, create in us a new mind. Renew the spirit that you've placed within us, Lord God. As you speak, Lord, we invite you to come. We ask that you speak. Your servants are listening. Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated. I want to say to you again, he's not talking about money here. Money is just the evidence of what's the deeper issue in this moment right now. Because we understand throughout the word, there's plenty of people that are celebrated for the wealth that they have. Abraham and Lot, they literally were so loaded that they couldn't live too close to one another because just their possessions would overtake the land and it was never held against them. The wealth isn't necessarily guaranteed for the believer. It's not like, well, if I love Jesus then I'm gonna be a millionaire, but it should never be looked down upon as, wow, what's that person doing with all that money? If they really love Jesus, they'd be broke as the rest of us. Because you see what... <laughs> What he says in Deuteronomy 15, six, he says, the Lord's gonna bless you as he has promised and you're gonna lend to many nations, but you will not borrow from any of them. Come on, I say again, that for the believer, as they walk in the blessing, they don't have to live in poverty. They don't have to be owned by the things that they own. He actually says that it's a good thing when you are blessed that you do not have to borrow, but you are actually blessed in abundance so that you can lend to others, he's not talking about wealth. He's not talking about wealth, but he is talking to us because he says, listen here, you who are wealthy, and you say, I'm not wealthy. No, you actually are. I think somebody said in our Bible study this past week that if you make more than $30,000, that you're like above the one percentile in the, in the world. I think we're all pulling in more than about 30K a year. Hopefully, if not, we will lay hands on you and believe God for a great job in your life. But honestly, um, but yeah, $30,000 or more and you're in the top one percentile of the world, he, but he's not, he's not talking about wealth. It's not a matter of how much you bring in. It's really more about the heart of generosity and obedience. Because what we do is we don't live in a biblical principle where we take the first 10% and bring it into the storehouse and give it unto God and live on the 90% as we steward what God has given us. What we do is we actually live on probably about 110% that I live on all of it and I'll give the church something when I can afford to give it, but really I gotta take as much as I can because the credit card's about to get tapped out because come on, pastor, it's December and that's what you do. You know, we just live above the line. So don't Think too highly of the self as you're going through this process. Own it and say, God, would you search my heart? Because that's what James is saying. He's saying, are you, 
Where's your heart at? Do you have the heart of obedience and generosity? Because what you find is that generosity is the natural response of a mature follower of Christ. And I can show you that right there in Luke chapter 19. When Jesus encounters Zacchaeus, we don't get a long story about Zacchaeus, but we know that Zacchaeus, for some reason, Luke found the need to put the man on blast for being of a short stature. And he puts him on blast there. It says, Zacchaeus, we know that he's short. We know that he sees Jesus and Jesus talks to him. He says, hey, Zacchaeus, let's go to your house and we're gonna eat. We don't know what the conversation is, but it doesn't say anywhere that Jesus chastised Zacchaeus for the way that he spent his money. But what we do see in verse nine, eight, the response of that one who now follows Christ, it says that Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, notice that's the same thing that James said, right? He said, you've had people work for you and you're not giving them any money and they're crying out against you now. He says, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, then I'm gonna pay back four times that amount. And Jesus' response is, he says, well, that's a good start, but we got a lot to go. Now, in verse nine, he says, today salvation has come unto this house. We don't know everything else that was said, but the revelation of Zacchaeus' heart in that moment to say that generosity now springs forth from my heart. Jesus says, there's one who follows me. I can do something with a, because again, if you just put it about money, then you say, okay, here you go, pastor, shut up, take my 10%. But if you have a heart of generosity now, it's not just about my money. It's about everything that I do. It's about my time. It's about my talents. It's about my love. It's about my words. It's about everything that I allow to take my attention. It's am I being generous with it or is it all about me? There's a difference between generosity that the world offers and the generosity that we find in the word of God because it's not just about generosity, but it's about obedience. Because a lot of times what we do is we like to give of our time, our talents, and our resources in conjunction with, again, how we feel. That's how, that's how the world works. You know, giving is a good tax write-off. Giving makes you feel good. Giving can be a strategic tool to get favors later on down the road, but that's not what we find when the Bible talks about generosity and giving. It's not just about helping out those that have helped you, you know, eye for an eye kind of thing. We can definitely lean into that, especially when we start talking about offerings. There's a place for that, but the tithe, the tithe is not something that we get to hold on to. It's just something that we freely release unto God and say, Lord, I'm giving this into the storehouse. I'm giving this into your church and I'm trusting you with every thing else. It's not just about the generosity, but it's about the obedience. And what you're going to find is, is if you need to have generosity and obedience in your life, then we run into the second thing that James addresses here. And that word is patience. I told the prayer team this morning, I said, if somebody told me I only had five minutes to talk this morning, the thing I would want to focus on more than anything is the patience. There's power when we learn to wait on the Lord. When you live on 110%, you don't have time to be patient. You gotta run and run and you better get a side hustle and you better get a couple scratch offs and you better do whatever it is that you can to get a couple extra dollars because you ain't gonna have enough. I don't have time to be patient. But James comes in and he hits right between the eyes and he says, watch, watch here in verse 11. He says, as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. Now that hits different because I'll tell you what, I don't know about you guys, but in church, we look towards the guy that has the pop-up church that hits a thousand within the first six months. That's the guy that you say it's blessed. We look towards the business owner that says, man, as soon as they got going, they got a building, they got all the things they needed, they went public with their stock and now they're just sitting fat and happy in Miami living their best life while somebody else works their thing and it only took them two years to do it. You know, that guy just got on the dating scene and he's already got this fine looking honey. Come on, I got, a, I got an amen back there from Matthew. <laughs> That's blessed. He didn't have to wait for nothing. Man, because surely, right, blessing would just be instantaneous. But James says, we count as blessed those who have persevered, who have heard of, man, then he, then he takes it to a whole nother level. Job's perseverance. Not just those who wait, but those who are waiting in some mess and have seen the Lord fully, uh, and have, let me say it right, you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. It wasn't a quick thing, but it was learned through patience. It says the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. See what you gotta understand about Job. I don't have the time to go through it all, but 
Day one starts with him losing all of his kids and all of his possessions. Shortly thereafter, his body is riddled with sores and he is left with a nagging spouse. I heard a comedian say, I have not fact-checked this, so don't quote me, but I heard a comedian say that, you know, Hitler fought the world for six years. And then history shows that he got married and moved into a bunker and within 24 hours, he killed himself. <laughs> Come on. Job was learning some perseverance. <laughs> that was for dad. Learning perseverance through the process. It wasn't instantaneous. Loses the family, loses all the possessions. He's left sitting on a dung pile, scraping his sores and his wife is nagging him. And now we're looking at him. And in the Jewish culture, he is set apart as like the standard for what perseverance looks like within the Jewish community. He's counted as blessed. While the woman is telling him in verse nine to curse God and die, Job's response is patience in every situation as he cries out in verse 10, he says, shall we indeed accept the goodness of God and not accept adversity? You see what Job is tapping into here in the area of patience is patience helps us as followers of Christ move to a place where we're no longer entering into a transactional relationship with Jesus. Can I unpack that for a second for you? See, the transactional relationship with Christ often happens when somebody comes up and says, would you like to make Jesus your Lord and Savior? And you're like, why? And it's like, because hell really sucks. Hey, that sounds great. What do I have to do not to go to hell? And so immediately we get into this transaction. What do I have to give? Well, it starts out that God gave his son for you. So now we need you to give this measure of obedience and goodness unto him. And then in exchange for that, you're going to not have to go to hell, and that sounds like a nice thing, and that's absolutely what the Bible teaches, but again, that's not the heart of what God was going after. It was about a relationship, not about a transaction. And so what happens is, is that as we move further down this line, we don't always say it like this, but what we think in our mind is, I've given a lot, and now I'm ready to ask God for something else, because the heaven thing sounds good, but to be honest, I'm still in my 30s. I'm not planning on dying anytime soon, and I could use some things right now. And so I'm gonna play some games and see if I can do some things so that I can manipulate God to give me some extra things that I want and not just at God's convenience, but I want it and I want it now. I want it all and I want it now. And Job says, are we going to just accept God when he gives us the good things and reject him when adversity comes? He's coming right at the heart of this transactional relationship he goes deeper in verse 21. He says, the Lord gives and he takes away. Blessed be your name. In Job 13, 15, he says, though he slays me, still I will hope in him. You know, it sounds a lot like the marriage vows, right? That we get into the marriage vows and it says, you know, I'm here to have and to hold you from this day forward. You guys said it before, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, for sickness and in health to love and to cherish until death do us part. That relationship with God, it wasn't about God, if you give me, then I'll give you. And you started out giving something, so I'm gonna give you in response. It's saying, God, I'm gonna be here for you when the days are the best days of my life. And I'm gonna be here on the worst days because even on my worst day, it's always better with God. For richer or poor, it doesn't matter what the bank account says because my God provides for all my needs according to his riches and glory. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and I know that I will never see the righteous forsaken or the seed begging for bread. His goodness and his mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So richer or poor, it doesn't matter what I see right here because I know that my God will provide. I just have to be patient. In sickness and in health, come on, I told you guys, it might be a little weird but I'll own it. If I'm gonna wake up and sound like Kermit the Frog, I'm gonna worship him through the process. Because here's what I understand, I only get to do stuff like this, this side of heaven. When you get into heaven, there's a new body, there's no sickness, there's no crying, there's no pain, there's no sorrow, there's no more uncertainty. We're just worshiping him in an open heaven, freely getting to see him, and it's gonna be an amazing day. But this side of heaven, we're now in this unique position where if we will wait upon the Lord, we can connect with him in a way that we will never be able 
to connect with him in heaven. And that is in the midst of our pain. It's in the midst of the uncertainty. Can I go as far as to say, learning to connect with God in the area of patience so that we can worship him even when he says no. God, I will still trust you. Though you slay me, still I hope in you. You are everything. Our patience, it's built through the heart of surrender and the heart of obedience. If I'm going to be generous, that means that I can't take everything that I have and give it towards myself. And if I'm going to be generous, then that means I'm not gonna always have the things that I want to play with, and so I will have to wait. But there's something powerful that happens in the waiting. There's something powerful that happens in the obedience. And Isaiah reveals it in chapter 40, 31. He says, they that wait upon the Lord, come on, you know this. It says they shall renew their strength. It's in the patience that they are mounted up on wings as eagles. It's when I'm patient that I run and I don't get weary. It's when I'm patient that I walk and I do not faint. Think about the magnitude of that right there. He says, they that wait upon the Lord have their strength renewed. But then he takes it to another level. He takes me, he says, I'm gonna bring you up on wings like eagles. And the imagery there is I'm gonna bring you above the problem and I'm gonna let you see from a new perspective. It's not that the problem has gone away. It's just the promise is so much greater. When he says he mounts you up on wings like eagles, you get new perspective. So it's not a problem to have to wait for a little while because I can see the promise ahead of me. He says that you can run and not grow weary and that you walk and not faint because if you can see it, you can walk to it. You can keep moving forward as long as you can keep your eyes focused on his promise. You see what sin tries to do, what the enemy wants to do when he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he wants to get the barrier up between you and God so you lose focus of the promise. And sometimes when we lose focus of the promise, you're gonna do one of two things. You're gonna stand still and do nothing or you're gonna run around like a chicken with your head cut off and start trying to work things out your own way. But there's difference between standing still and running around like a crazy person and that difference is found in the waiting. Sometimes waiting is movement. Sometimes waiting is prayer. Sometimes prayer is just simply worshiping God through the process, not expecting anything more than just to encounter the King of Kings and saying, God, when I wait on you, you change perspective. You bring me up higher, Lord God. So I am not in that pit of despair that the rest of the world has to wallow around in. And when I see you, I can run as far as I need to run. There's no such thing as church burnout when you learn how to wait on the Lord. There's no such thing as giving up and walking away from the faith when you learn how to wait on the Lord. Because they that wait on the Lord, their strength is renewed. They have new perspective. They can keep on running and keep on running and keep on running and keep on running because they know the promise that's yet to come. You guys with me? So the last component, he says, you got generosity, you got obedience. If you're gonna be generous and you're gonna obey God and give the way that he tells you to give, then that means you're gonna have to learn patience. But then can I bring you to church this morning and tell you that if you're gonna learn patience, you gotta ask, well, what am I gonna do while I wait? He starts talking about prayer, y'all. We haven't made the graphics for it yet. I don't know if you guys saw, but I did a solid for our graphics team here and I spelled a word wrong on one of our new banners. <laughs> So we haven't made all of our new banners yet for 2023, but the word of the Lord that's going forth to us uh, is focusing a lot around this area of prayer because we've seen God do some amazing things on our nights of prayer. We've seen God do amazing things just even from 9.30 to 10 o'clock here on Sunday mornings. If you guys have been tracking with us, there's times where prayer literally just pours right into worship. We don't do little cute countdowns or anything at that point. We just run right into his presence because we're already there. So let's just go deeper. But James says, if you're gonna be generous and obedient, then that means you are going to need patience. And then if you're gonna be waiting, I just feel like he's kind of speaking to some of the ADD people out there in the church today. He says, and if you're waiting, what are you gonna do while you wait? You can't just sit there and stare at the wall and watch the paint dry. And so he starts talking about prayer. Now this is powerful because he's talking to people that need to become mature followers of Christ, not just placating to those who want to be the Sunday morning Christians or the Christian in name only. So in verse 13 of James chapter five, he jumps in, he says, is any among you in trouble? 
then let them pray. Somebody say them pray. <laughs> let them pray. Is anyone happy? Then let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Then let the elders of the church pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered up in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Do you see the community here, y'all? You see how you can't be a little closet, closet Christian all alone? Because he's telling you when you're in a certain measure of trouble here, you need someone else. He says, therefore, you can confess your sins to someone and each of you, and they will pray for you, and then you will be healed for the prayer of the righteous person is effective. I love the way he starts that because he's talking to a mature follower of Christ. I have a two-year-old, I have a five-year-old, and I have an eight-year-old. Believe that or not. <laughs> Somebody was showing me a lot of love this morning and they thought I was 27 years old. They saw like my middle child walk in and say hi to me. He's like, that was your kid? Thank you for making me feel good. Anyways, I'm not 27, I'm 28. Anyways. He starts in, he says, are you in trouble? He doesn't say go run to the pastor. He doesn't say go blast it on Facebook. He says, pray for yourself. I was telling you, I got a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and an eight-year-old. There's very little expectation of the two-year-old, especially when it comes to eating food. It's just, if she gets it in the mouth, it's a win. I don't know why it has to start with the forehead and work its way down to the nose and then into the mouth, but when it's in the mouth, that's a win. We don't expect her to buy it. We don't expect her to prepare it. We barely expect her to get it from hand into mouth. A lot of times Lauren's like, this one's messier than I'm willing to battle with, so I'll eat later. I'm just gonna feed the child. The struggle gets real. But he says, you're a mature follower of Christ. You're not a baby. We've been doing this for a while now, y'all. He says, if you're in trouble, pray for yourself. Come on, pick yourself up. You don't know how, that's okay. The disciples were bold enough to ask Jesus, hey, would you teach us how to pray? We get it. Like we, we understand because he's, he's dropping hints throughout the three years that he spends with them. He's dropping hints that I'm not always gonna be with you. And so I feel like there's some wisdom there. Every once in a while, they say, well, would you teach us then how to do what it is that you're doing? Church, I can tell you right now, James says in the earlier part of the book, he says, if you need wisdom, all you gotta do is ask. God's gonna give it to you. If you need to learn how to pray, you can ask God how to pray. But he's absolutely saying, hey, mature follower of Christ, Pray for yourself. Then he takes it to another level, which this is huge right here. I'm telling you what, when the gathering gets to this place, y'all, we're gonna be an unstoppable force like you've never seen. Because then he says, he says, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Now, when I read that, what I saw was the image of a follower of Christ. And anytime that we get smacked down on our back, if you guys watch UFC, you know, there's guys that do the ground and pound game and stuff like that. And I just got this picture of the church is way too comfortable fighting on their back. We're way too comfortable getting knocked around and then it's like, oh my God, okay, I'm down here again. Now I'm gonna turn unto God. What would it look like if a church was back up on their feet in the stands ready to go? Ready to go. He's saying when you are going, when life is going good, that's the time when you need to start praising. Have you ever got to connect with God when everything around you seems to be going good? I understand that it's easy to run to him whenever we got the problems, but what about when all I need to do is just praise God? What would it look like if the gates of hell couldn't prevail against the church whenever they're standing up on their feet and they're just ready to start popping them left and right. I'm not waiting to get knocked back down by the devil. He doesn't have a chance to knock me down anymore because I've positioned myself with praise and I'm ready to do a fight right in the midst of the best days of my life, y'all. Come on, some of you guys have been blessed and you have been highly favored and this is your season to get a praise out that scares the devil back so bad that he can't touch your children, he can't touch your family, he can't touch your job or anything else, y'all. Does anybody have a praise in this house? I'm talking about a praise in the good times. I get it, praising in the bad times, but could you praise him through the midst of the best days of your life? Come on, the best days of our life. He says, the mature follower of Christ, he prays continually. Do you understand? It's easy to be patient when I don't feel like the devil's breathing down my neck. And it's okay to be a follower of Christ and not always feel like you got the devil nipping at your heels. Come on, there can be joy in his presence. And when I'm at rest, then how much easier is it for me to be obedient? How much easier is it for me to be generous? 
when I find myself in a position where I'm ready to attack at a moment's notice. And then James comes back around to community. He deals with us first. He says, if you're in trouble, pray. He says, if you're doing good, man, rejoice in the Lord and always. And then the third one, he says, is any among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. The sickness that they use there for that word, I'm not gonna bore you with all kinds of words that we don't even know how to say. (laughs) But what he's talking about there, it's not just physical healing, although there is physical healing evident in this word. He's also just talking about the emotional and just the weakness that we find in just the daily grind of our lives. He's saying, if you're weak, or maybe you're weak because your sin has put a barrier once again between the Lord and you found yourself now fighting on your own. You found yourself in a position where you can't connect with God in the way that you need to connect with God. So all you know to do now is to fight on your own. He said, and you're feeling weak. And that's that weakness that he's talking about there. He says, when you get to that place, if I bring you back up, he says, let them call on the elders of the church and they will anoint them with oil. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. So he's talking about the healing there. But then he goes deeper. When he starts saying that they will be, um, uh, where does it go? Where does it go? And the prayer offered in the faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up if they have sinned. Here we go. Verse 15. They will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. See, that's a different, that's a different focus now. He's, he's dealt with the physical healing. Now he's talking about relationship. Now he's talking about personal strength. Now he's talking about the ability to fulfill and do that thing that God has called you to do. And the reason why you need community, church family, is because it's not just about a cute little prayer. The reason why we confess sin, this isn't some weird Catholic thing where we can't talk to God and we gotta have some priest sprinkle us and do a couple confessionals. That's not what this is. This is, hey, Chris, I'm struggling with something right now and I need you to hold me accountable to it. I need you to pray for me and I appreciate the prayer, but I also just need somebody to check in every once in a while. Come on, can we be the church? that God has called us to be family? Because I'm telling you, this has been a year of returning and rebuilding. This hasn't been a year of like supernatural crazy growth because I believe that what God is wanting to do in this next year at the gathering is he's gonna start bringing us some people with a lot of busted stuff. And what we know is, is that hurting people hurt people. And so the only way that we can combat that is that we need to be a healthy, strong body of mature believers, living a life that's inviting others to embrace Jesus. And a lot of those people are gonna be the ones that you see for the very first time walking into these doors. And if you have not learned how to pray for yourself, if you haven't learned how to give God praise, if you haven't learned how to walk your own faith out in fear and trembling, then somebody else is gonna come right on in here and bowl you right over. And they're coming in because they need something more than what they can get from some kind of a religious organization. They need an encounter with God. And it's gonna be experienced, not just through those songs, although his presence is so good. It's not gonna just be heard through the message, although Holy Spirit's been so faithful to speak. It's gonna be seen in your hands and your feet, in the words that you speak. I wanna see a church that rises up and understands that they carry the voice of the Father, the voice of the one. We are the ones that are the voice crawling out in the wilderness making way for the king to come. Come on, if it's just Lauren and I doing this thing, it's not gonna ever work, y'all. But when the body of Christ comes together and takes ownership of the call that they have on their life, there's nothing, nothing that's impossible for our God. There's nothing that's impossible. He says, come together. We'll lay hands and we're gonna see the sick healed. Come on up, mom. We're gonna lay hands and see the sick healed. He's gonna heal the brokenhearted. Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In your presence, God, there's fullness of joy. Come on, church, would you stand to your feet? Let's just begin to talk to Jesus right now. Come on. Lord, you've called us. You've called us to be a people of prayer, not just a people that feed off of a religious body, but we are a people 
that have a personal relationship with you first and foremost, Lord God, and that personal relationship calls us to accountability within a larger body of believers, Lord God. And as a body of Christ, the gates of hell shall not prevail. That Jesus, when you looked at Peter, you said that it was on this rock, on this gathering of people, that was the ecclesia there, on this gathering of people, it will build the church and the gates of hell shall not. It wasn't just on the back of one man, but it was on the back of a community that loved you, that was passionate about your word, that we would draw a line and say this is absolute truth this is the way that God wants it done and so we will do it out of direct obedience unto you Lord God let us be a people that are set apart let us be a people that are made distinct by your presence as Moses said Lord God not a people that are distinct by our cute little programs not a people that are distinct by our lights and our sound and our excellence Lord God but a people that are distinct because of the presence of the most high God that those who are longing to see something more than what they can find within themselves. I'm not interested in the works of a man. Lord God, I want you and I want you alone. You alone can satisfy the longings of my heart, Lord Jesus. I've tasted and I've seen of the goodness and I want more. Come on, we're calling out. I want more. Jesus, give us more. More of you, Lord God.